Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, we'll read a few verses, and then we're going to talk about what does faith teach us? What does faith teach us? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, faith, the elders obtained a good report, or a good testimony. Through faith, we understand that the worlds are framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made which to appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. What a testimony to have that he pleased God. By the way, tomorrow is the National Day of Prayer. If there's any uh, any time that you should be praying for our country, praying for, for the works of God, it's now. What a mess this country's in. And so it's our faith. It's our faith that extended. It's our faith that, that moves mountains. It's our faith that, that motivates and touches people's hearts, changes the mind of God, and motivates and changes the heart of people. It's our faith. That's what we need to pray like we've never prayed before. And verse, six, verse 6 is this. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The aspect about faith lets us, gives us an unshaken confidence in our living God. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 23. When we look at our different hymns, many of our hymns were written during times of, of trouble and problems and heartaches. And it was that faith in God that gave them the solace. It was the faith in God that said, no matter what's happened, I can still go on with my life. It may be tough, but I know I'm not alone. It's my faith and belief in what God has said in his word, what he has done in my life, or what I've seen in other people's life. It's my faith in God that's going to get me through. It's my anchor through all the storms. Verse 23 of chapter 10 says this. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Hold fast the profession of our faith. I can't. I cannot believe how you have talked to in the few years, how you say, well, I just don't know if I believe in God anymore. Why not? Why would a loving God do this? Why would a loving God allow this? Why would a loving God abandon people? So first of all, God doesn't abandon anyone. People choose to accept them they choose to reject him. When he says, I will never leave you nor forsake thee, the only way that's going to happen is that you say, here, you stay here, God. I don't need you anymore. And God loves us enough to respect our wishes, even though it's wrong. That's called the volition of will. Now, to me, that, that, that's hard to comprehend. But I know in my personal life, God has allowed me to make bad decisions, caused me to realize, boy, I need to get back to God, and I need to, I need to get back where I need to be and start listening to him and realize going outside of what he wants, there's a lot of danger out there. Like we talk about that hedge of protection, you know, that protection that God gives to us through our lives and, and that hedge of protection which is provided through, through prayer. And uh, God's being there with us. And you know, it's kind of like that fence right there. That fence is either there to uh, be a hindrance to us or protection for us. I believe that the hedge of protection God gives each one of us everywhere we go to keep us safe. To keep us to realize 
that it's a whole lot better. There's a whole lot more blessings inside the inside the hedge than trying to go outside the hedge. It's not like um, those that um, think that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. The problem is, is that if you want that type of grass, then water your own side. There's a camel off of Forest Street down by Van Beesler's. And um, in the afternoon, I have a little, a little second grader, and um, she's enamored with that. And uh, on Monday, she said, stop, stop. I said, why? She said, stop. I, said, I can't stop. I got people behind me. She said, we need to get that and rescue that camel. How are we going to rescue the camel? <laughs> Put him on the bus. <laughs> and what are we going to do when we get him on the bus? I'll hold on to him and drop him off in my house. What will your parents say? <laughs> I said, I tell you what, you go home and you ask mom or dad if it's okay. And if they'll tell me at the bus, I want to hear from them, not from you. They say it's okay for us to rescue the camel and bring them on the bus and take them to your house. I'll do it. Really? I'm thinking, please don't let them, <laughs> don't let them say because I'm stuck. <laughs> so hey, so she, she told me the next day, she said, my mom and dad laughed. I said, why? Because I wanted to save the camel. <laughs> I said, why, let's go. why do you want to save the camel? Because there's just not enough grass inside the fence. It has to put its head out over the, over the fence to eat grass. I said, but there's a whole bunch on the back side of the field that's not even touching. No, it's not so I showed her today. She said, hey, you're right. I said, where's the camel? Probably hiding from me because it doesn't want to, I want to save him. <laughs> uh, it's that childlike faith that they can, they can conquer the world. And so she, her parents were just, they just, they laughed and they, they said to her, she has a big heart, but sometimes the heart and head don't connect sometimes. <laughs> well, that's most kids. She was so worried about the, that camel having enough grass that she, she could see the grass outside the fence, but couldn't see the grass inside the fence. Faith. Faith has got to ex be extended to believe that what God promises, he's going to follow through. That's what faith is. And that's why as believers, why do you think Satan works so hard for people to doubt their salvation? to doubt their Christianity, to cause them to waver whether it's important to be in church or not, why it's important to, to serve the Lord or not, why it's important to share share their testimonies or, or give their tithes and offerings. Why do you think Satan works so hard? Because he knows that a person that understands they're grounded on the rock, the foundation of Jesus Christ, no matter how bad things are, is not going to go anywhere because we are founded and controlled and protected by our foundation, Jesus Christ. That's why he works on Christians. Not just church members, but pastors. Not just pastors, but pastors' wives and servants of the Lord. Is that Satan is on full-on attack against the people of God right now. And ever, more than ever before, no matter how things turn out, whatever's happening, we should never waver in what happened when we got saved and how it has gone from the time we got saved to where it is right now. My faith has increased since February 4th, 1979. Why would I want to favor on the goodness of God? Why would I want to, why would I want to favor, why would I want to miss out on the presence of God seemingly to wrap his arms about me and say, it's going to be okay, my child. I've got it all under control. There's no greater feeling to know that the presence of God is with you. There's something about that. It cannot be explained. It's a peace of God the Bible talks about. And so when we look at the fact is that a life of unshaken confidence in a living God, the writer encourages them in the midst of persecutions and trials with quick sketches of the patriarchs who had conquered the enemy by faith. And we're going to look at some, just going to touch about several of the patriarchs that are found out of Hebrews chapter 11, we call the hall of faith. Or when you start start struggling with your faith, or you start wondering what's going on, 
take each one of these these people of the scriptures and go back to the Old Testament or and and start reading about them and reading about their lives and what they were challenged to do. When you think about this, to think about the um, the twofold effect of spiritual faith, it says uh, in verse verse one of Hebrews chapter eleven. Now, faith is a substance. and the evidence not seen. The word substance means assured confidence on the things hoped for, and the evidence or the demonstration of things not seen. The word for substance is one found in ancient legal documents bearing on your ownership of property. It means a title deed, hence your inner assurance of ownership of the future. We don't know about the future, but we know the person that knows the future, don't we? So we don't have to worry what, what we have to go up ahead on because God says, sufficient unto the day. Don't worry about tomorrow, I'm already there. Don't worry about tomorrow, I've got all that taken care of. Just worry about what today holds. And there may be good days and there may be bad days. There may be days of disappointment, there may be days that we're ecstatic. We run the whole gamut of emotions, don't we? But the one thing about it, our faith is deeper than its emotions. It's based upon the fact of the character of an almighty God. That's our faith is grounded in. It's based on God. And if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he's not going anywhere. He was here before time started. He was here. He's been here during time. And he'll be here after time leaves. No matter what comes our way, what struggles that we have, what type of challenges that we have, what type of disappointments that we're dealing with, the things that we're afraid of, the things that are just that are just shaking us to our core, but our faith says it's going to be okay. You got to fight through this. I've got this under control. So the aspect about the twofold effect of spiritual faith. And so uh, what are the two, the first essential requirements in faith? Look at verse six. It says this. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. That you got to believe that God exists. You know, it takes more faith to believe that God doesn't exist than God, God exists. You see it in nature. Doth that nature itself teach you? One thing that I've, I've talked to you about is that the Neosha River, now going down 400. And I've always been amazed at how, I mean, you know, the rain comes and it comes down this way. And I mean, it just, I mean, there's some serious flooding going on over there. What's going to happen after a little bit? It'll eventually dry up and they're going to plant something. And part of where the water is, where the silt comes off of the Nyosha River, is a big pecan, pecan uh, field, huge pecan trees. And every year, they're going to shake those babies down and they're going to get great harvests. So in the midst of what we think is a tragedy of a flood, God uses that to fertilize his creation to bless not just, not just the animals, but us with different types of fruits and things like that. Only a God can think like that. Only a God looks at the, the past and works in the present and thinks about the future. Only God, why can Because he knows what's gonna happen. He knows how everything's gonna work out. So when you look at the fact of an evidence of our faith that it must believe that he is and that he is a re rewarder of, the, of those that diligently seek him. So the fact is that we've gotta believe that he is, but then also, Faith is therefore belief in a person that trusts in a promise. The promise that God never fails. And hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised for the world began. What he has promised still is uh, going on today. But what's happening around the world, especially in Israel. And our country denying, denying Israel. And uh, the, the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, is still in effect. I'll bless those that bless thee, and I'll curse those that curse thee. It's been amazing since our leadership 
has started denying Israel and supporting the enemies of Israel, what's happening in our country? It says in the book of Nahum that he has his way in the whirlwinds and the storms. There have been more tornadoes to date right now with the least amount of fatalities. So what am I saying? Is that America better be careful. They've gotten God stirred up. And I was watching a, a, a video of a, a, a storm chaser, and I think somewhere in, or outside of Manhattan called Hillsborough, I think it is. And literally they saw the forming of the, the, the base of the tornado, and then all of a sudden, while well, you have the, the base spinning out of control and things there were, and then it goes up and it gets smaller and goes up and then it becomes like a, like a whip and it goes up and over and then up again, up into the clouds. He said, I've done a lot of, I've seen a lot of tornadoes. I've never seen anything like this one before. If he has his way in the world with a storm, who's the one that allows that to happen? We don't like to see property damage. I, this part of the year is, is a tough time because you're worried about what can happen at any moment. I've told our kids that when that horn goes off, you better be in the van. Because if you're not, God bless you. I'll say a prayer as I'm leaving you. <laughs> <laughs> We're gone. We're gone. <laughs> and the guy said, when the boy said, are you afraid of, this, of the tornadoes? No, I'm afraid of what happens after the tornadoes are here. That's what I'm worried about. And so I don't want to do, be anywhere around that tornado. America better be very careful with all the denying of Israel and fighting against Israel and the pro-abortion going on right now. All those things gets God's attention. And as the old preachers used to say, don't get God in the killing mood. Don't do it because God is serious when it comes to protecting his people and, and, his, and not just us, but the nation of Israel. So the aspect of God's promises are applicable today as what they were when they were first written. So we see that we must believe that he is and that he rewards our faith. Now, how much faith do we need to have to be rewarded? Size of mustard seed. That's not a lot. And so if it's not that, that much, why do we choose to worry instead of believe? Why do we choose to manipulate circumstances that are saying, Lord, you're in charge, you're in control, as hard as what it is, Lord, I'm gonna take my hands off it, I give this to you because you're a much better repairer, fixer-upper than I am. That's our faith. And that's why we should understand that when Satan is coming against us, he is attacking our faith and who we believe in. Satan's not happy that you and I believe in Jesus. He is, he is more concerned about your personal walk with God than anything you're doing for him. Because he knows if he can, he can shake you up and un, unroot you and pull you up from that, then he knows that he has basically made you eliminated from what you can do. And then he can guilt you, make you feel bad, thinking, well, my life doesn't mean anything. I must just give up and quit. And that's a lot of people doing nowadays. Instead of getting up, dusting themselves off, and getting back after it. And so the, that's another about that. But then let's go back to Hebrews chapter 1. It says this. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. The elders re obtained a good report. What? Their faith. Now, remember, in the Old Testament, they only had portions of Scripture. Mostly they had prophets preaching. They didn't have the Word of God as we have it. Then you had that 400-year time of silence before John the Baptist came out. And at the beginning of the, the uh, 
first century, there was very little parchments about about from the scriptures. It was all word of mouth. It was those prop, those preachers, those servants of God, boldly proclaiming what thus said the Lord has to say. And by what they said, their testimony was assured because what they said was true and they couldn't be shaken. That's why when they, they were martyred for their faith, the people were just motivated to do more for the Lord instead of backing off. That's one thing that all these communist groups, they've tried to burn Bibles. What happens when they burn Bibles? More Bibles show up. They try to imprison Christians, shut down churches. Guess what happened? There's more Christians and more churches established. Because what they're trying to do is a, is a, a visual thing. And we realize our faith is a spiritual thing. Our, ba- our faith is, th- is based upon the things that we hope for and the evidence of things not seen. That's where our faith is at. And that's why the old saying that the, the blood of the martyrs is the seeds of the church. How many places in China and Vietnam and and in Russia, and during the eastern part, eastern part of Europe, when they had the Cold War going on, and you had people coming and sneaking Bibles and getting scriptures to people, and people's lives were being saved right and left because they realized that Christianity was had something of value to hold on to, because what the world had to offer and communists had to offer had nothing whatsoever. It's kind of like eating styrofoam. You can put as much peanut butter or or jelly on there. It's still old nasty styrofoam. You can have styrofoam. I'm not talking about those rice cakes. I'm talking about styrofoam. (laughs) So, So what is the very first thing a true faith teaches everything? teaches us first verse three says this through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of god what is the first thing that true faith teaches us that god created everything in the beginning was the word in the beginning god said let there be light and he put that light in an orbit and he made daylight and he made nightlight. You had the sun, you had the moon, you had the stars, which he personally names every one of them. That's a lot of names out there that God knows. He made all that. He made the trees, he made the birds, he made the animals, he made it all. Then when it came to us, He didn't speak us into existence. He took us out of of the clay of the ground and made us, formed us with his hands and breathed in us the breath of life because we were special. And if there's anything, I've talked to a lot of people. I deal with a lot of people that deal with lack of self-worth, especially on the Christian. They'll say, well, my, I mean, God, how can God love me? Because he can, he does. Do you know that God personally formed you with his hands? That before anyone else saw you, God was already working on you. That's how special you are to God. He knows your innermost thoughts. He knows your innermost uh, workings of your life. He knows everything about you and still loves you anyway. If there's anything that we have to understand about our faith is that our faith should constantly be reminded of, hey, God made that. And if God can make that, he can do whatever else he wants to do. He can do exceedingly abundant above all that we ask or think based upon the power that is in us. And what's the power that is in us? The Spirit of God. And so the first thing true faith teaches us is God created everything. 
I love in the morning when I'm I'm sitting at my bus and my bus leaves about six thirty five between six thirty five and six forty. And now I love this part of the year because I can sit on my bus and I'll be drinking my coffee and I can watch from darkness that little line. Sometimes it's white, sometimes it's red, but all of a sudden it goes from that in a big burst of, of light. And then you're blinded for a little while because I have to drive in that thing all the time. God makes it every day. What other entity can do something so perfect than our God? There is no other entities besides our God. So that's the first thing that true faith teaches us. But then also, look at... Um, Look, go back to uh, Hebrews chapter 9. So we see the aspect of God taught, teaches us through creation that he is a God. But then also, we see that in this hall of faith, in verse 4 it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speak it. And so what does the faith of Abel teach us? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says this. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without, the, without shedding of blood is no remission. What they were supposed to do, Cain was supposed to, and so was Abel, supposed to bring a sacrifice to God. Abel brought, he was a shepherd, so he brought a, 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 a blood sacrifice. Cain was a farmer, and he brought the best of the best from his garden. God honored Abel's sacrifice and rejected Cain's sacrifice. And the difference was the shedding of blood. You see, who was, who was Abel's father? Adam. Adam's task was to teach his boys what God wanted them to know about sacrifices, about fellowship with God. You say, even when they, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they told God that they were afraid, God provided a covering for them. Now they lost the Garden of Eden but they gained fellowship with God because of that covering. Something had to be sacrificed. And so Adam was, was tasked to teach both Cain and Abel what they were supposed to do regarding the covering and the sacrifice. As with everyone, some accept it, some manipulate it. Well, bring your best. Well, if you're a gardener, you're going to bring the very best of your garden, aren't you? You're going to bring the best, I mean, the richest, ripest uh, tomatoes and corn and squash and, and all those different things out there. Yes, but there's no blood involved in that. And Abel brought an old nasty animal because he was a, far, a shepherd, but that's exactly what he wanted. It wasn't the difference between something that was beautiful and something that was dirty. It was the fact that there was a blood sacrifice, which is a picture of Jesus Christ shedding his blood for us on the cross. That's why you had the sacrifices from that time on. And when they came to sacrificing for fellowship with God, they had to have a, a, a lamb and had to put the, lamb, the blood of the lamb on the uh, mercy seat and uh, in, in, in the temples. So the aspect of the first thing that um, Abel, the faith of Abel was that he needed the shedding of blood. Now go to Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10. Verse 17 says this, and then we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, 
and hearing by the word of God. Now go to Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So both the boys were to listen to dad when God told Adam to do that. Verse 4 says this, By faith Abel offered a God, unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness, because he listened and followed through, that he was righteous. You see, faith is, we've got to accept that faith. Abel accepted the word, Cain denied the word. Hence, a picture of doing religion and done religion. Doing is a series of works. Baptism, church attendance, feeding the hungry, doing this, doing that, with the hopes that when they die, that when they stand up before God, God's going to put out the, uh, the weights and say, okay, we're going to see how good you did compared to how bad you did. Let's weigh them all out. If you did more good than bad, then you're going to be accepted. That's, that takes more faith to believe in that than just believing that I'm accept the shed blood of Jesus Christ for my salvation to get to heaven. That's doing. Ours is done. Why? Because on the cross, Jesus said to tell us die. Pay in full. Pay in full. And that's the aspect of our faith that we need to understand is that God is going to teach us many different things. It's a matter of are we going to accept it or are we going to reject it? That's where our faith is going to grow or Satan's going to attack. And if he senses a little bit of a weakness, he's going to keep working and hammering and hammering. And he's going to try to, unless we fortify it, then he's going to open it up and then that's where he really attacks people's lives. That's the aspect of our faith that, that, that we should know is that Faith is an action word. It's not a noun. We've got to keep working on it, keep working on it, and learning from those people that have gone before us. Because we learn from those that have gone before us, then we can fortify our faith. Say, if they can do it, I can do it. If simple people like we know can be faithful to serve God and see God's blessing, then we can experience the very same things because God doesn't play favorites. God is not a favorite favorite type of a God. Thank God for that. We serve a good God, don't we? Well, amen. Well, let's just stop right there. I will make a note of that, and then we'll go from there next week.